Hello, everyone. We are back with episode six, the final countdown, as we were just singing. It um, is. <laughs> it is. It's the final countdown. So we just did the semifinals this week. And oh, we have so much to talk about today. It's going to be so wonderful. Um, Can't wait. <laughs> yes, I can't either. And as you can see, Aaron and I are matching this week. We didn't do that on purpose, but yay. <laughs> so it's just the two of us today. And we are excited to talk about a few things. The first one that we want to talk about is money. <laughs> Aaron. It's all about the money. <laughs> <laughs> yep. so, so go ahead. <laughs> we were just talking about the annual meeting and Aaron has a really great announcement to tell all of you out there, um, whether you're a student or an aspiring student or a professional that is going back to get another credential. So you're doing um, some more schooling, like we've seen Carlo and Catherine. That's kind of funny that they have, you know, the K sound. Um, they're both going back to do DCLS. Um, we, we just wanna know, can you qualify as a student member with ASCP if you are already a credentialed um, professional but you're going back to school. So Aaron, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, so you actually can qualify to become a student member again. So we all wanna excel in our profession and just keep moving forward. So um, just like Alfonso from week two, uh, he went from being an MLT to an MLS and just kept going. So if you're at the MLT phase or phlebotomy phase and you're going to that next step, um, you can actually become a student member again and get those student member benefits for free. Um, from, right? For free, exactly. For free. for free. So journal access, you get a free membership card, free involvement, free journals. Um, and just you see, so you get to still be a part of ASCP. And then for those of you guys out there, since we're talking about money, um, if you have come on hard times and you can't afford your membership, ACP does actually have programs that can actually help you qualify for uh, some financial assistance. So on the website, there is a place that you can go to actually get the financial support. And so you don't have to let your membership go and all the great benefits and networking and all that great stuff go. You can get a little bit of extra help because um, we're all stronger together. That's right. Um, yep, exactly. And then the Big thing I'm gonna keep reminding you guys about is this year is the 100 year centennial ASCP annual meeting. So it's been 100 years of ASCP. Yes. So every member can attend for free. It's student a student or professional, right? Anybody. Exactly. It's an over usually 150, 200, $300 value that you're going to get for free. So just renew your membership and you can go for free. Absolutely. So we can yeah. all see each other in 2022 exactly. and exactly. September this time. So it was yes. October this, um, you know, this past, past month, year, yeah. but now it's going to be in September. So I'm yeah, so excited. Be. So we'll get be. to see all of you hopefully next year at the annual meeting for free. <laughs> <laughs> for free. Yeah. For well, free. I don't know Tiffany. about the hotel though, but you know, yes. <laughs> Are you ready? Ready for what? Are you ready to sell <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Crowd goes wild. Um, Woo! Sell ball. Ready? Semi finals. Yes, it's going to be a blast. blast. Woo! <laughs> All right. I'm so ready. let me share my screen. Um, I am so excited to talk about the semifinals today. There has been so much going on this week. And, oh, uh, Lots and lots to talk about. So oh. here we are. Oh my gosh. Aaron, can you believe it's week six already? I cannot. We are down to our last three teams. This is crazy. Out, out of 77? I, yeah, something like that. It was like yeah. 73. It was in the 70s. It was crazy amount of participants. And then we had... Um, you know, the regionals all the way to the playoffs. Now we're in the semifinals. And next time is going to be the what, Aaron? The first ever Super, Super Soul. Soul. Yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Oh. So we are really excited for the teams. Um, so this is this is the breakdown this week. Oh my gosh. Um, this week again for globally. Oh <laughs> globally, we gave away the fanny pack. Um <laughs> so uh, that's the fanny a nice pack, one. <laughs> the fanny pack has been a um constant. <laughs> a uh, participant in our episodes because I just keep pulling it out. Um, but here it is, ladies and gentlemen, and Stacy Conley from West Virginia happened to be the winner. This Congratulations. Week. Congratulations. All of you globally, you have one more week to try to get in here. Stop letting the USA take it. Come on, mm. get in here. Have some fun. It looks like looks like that fanny pack's right on the feathered edge, too. It is. <laughs> it's got that beautiful <laughs> it like, cat's tongue kind of deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so, a good salsa. We do. We do have some lovely. Congratulations, Stacy. Yes. Thank you for playing, Stacy. And thank you for beating my score. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are here at the semifinals. It's almost dancing there. I love it. All right, so this is where it comes down to the nitty gritty. The, the touchdown this week was West Virginia. We've got Southern West Virginia Community College and sorry, Community and Technical College, the MLT program there had the best score, um, the best time this week. And the only thing they were struggling was um, with identifying erythroblasts, which is very understandable because <laughs> they are hard. Those, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they actually look like lymphocytes. It's craziness. So, you know, absolutely great job. Who took second place this week, Aaron? I can't believe it. The East has actually beaten out Weber State. Yes, just barely at time. 3.9 and no struggles. I don't no. believe it, but with that crazy time, still. Yeah. Great job, Weaver State. I honestly don't think that if you've made it lower than 25 seconds that you're struggling with anything because no. <laughs> you know, no. if you're able to do it in that <laughs> quick of amount of time, you're just zooming. There's smoke yep. coming from your fingertips. You are just going that fast. Craziness. Yeah. And right. Marissa James and I from last week are still trying to get our times up. And <laughs> yeah, we're wondering if it's humanly possible. So <laughs> reach out. And they, and who's rounding out? Who's in uh, third right now? We had Northeast Wisconsin Technical College, Catherine's friends <sighs> over in Wisconsin. They were a close third. Look how close that was. It was like 0. 0.2 seconds, roughly. You know, crazy how close this is. And so um, uh, we had, I wanted to put in here just to show you all how wonderful this is. We have MLTs in all three of these and one MLS also. So uh, Weber State has both types of programs there. So they've been, um, coming together as a program or two programs together as an institutional team, which is what you're supposed to be doing. So this is wonderful. I'm, I'm so excited to uh, see the MLTs represented so highly and MLSs also. So this is, this is really great. I'm really proud of everybody. Great job, everybody. Yeah. Wow. And um, so you know what that means though, with them being number three, what does that mean? I know. They're, they're not making it to the no it's so zone. close though yeah this close this close um so let's continue on um, yeah i can't it's so close it's really that it close. is it's been quite the shift <laughs> absolutely <laughs> look where we look where we've come from yes this is uh, so the next two slides are going to be um, where we've come from and where we're going. So uh, here we have on the left, we've got the trophy that we're competing for hypothetically. And we've got um, Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College. And we've got Weber State um, hashing it out for the, <laughs> for the win next week. And Actually, we're filming this on Sunday, so it'll be tomorrow. 
Um, <laughs> so it's but really look exciting. At, look yeah. at all this team, like the top, the top 25. Look how every, it was so close at points, even just who made it into the top yeah. three and now into the, the final. So I want to explain, um, I just want to explain this a tiny bit because even though we've got times on here, if you're in seventh um, to 25th place here, that was your average score for the, the four weeks, okay? Because I know that um, we were second place in the nation on week four, College of Southern Maryland was, because our time was uh, right below um, West Virginia again. <laughs> So they, they had the touchdown for that week in week four, we were a very close second. And, um, you know, so if we had gone with our best score, it would have been, uh, less than this average that we have here. So if you're seeing the same kind of situation for your team, remember that these are average scores down from seven to 25. Now, the rest of these scores from six to one are what they scored in the playoffs and the semifinals and the Super Cell Bowl. So those are not going to be average scores. So please make sure that you remember that because um, I know, you know, some students are like, I got a better score than that. Why is that? Why is that what's represented there? So just make sure you understand that part. So we've got some really wonderful representation here. Um, okay. We have uh, number one and number two are going to be solidified this upcoming week. The Eagles have landed. <laughs> and <number laughs> <waiting three>. that. <laughs> I was I was thinking about that all week. <laughs> the Eagles have landed in spot three, um, third place. And then we've got the Argonauts in fourth, the Jayhawks in fifth, and the Aggies in sixth place. And they then, beat out my um, West Florida. Yeah, they, they did. They beat out the seashell. They did. It's right still, there. Still beat the Jayhawks, though. <laughs> oh. Surrounded in <laughs> <and> birds. <laughs> do, you, do you hear that, Dana? <laughs> All right. So. Um, You'll find me later. <laughs> yeah. We'll have a conversation behind the. <laughs> after the episode, right? She'll take you out back, tell you mm -hmm. what's what. Yeah. <laughs> Texas was so close to getting in there. Um, UT Health from San Antonio, just like um, Alfonso is from there. So he was really rooting for you all. And Aaron, do you want to talk to West Florida for a second? Because I did hear on, on, um, on uh, YouTube that they were very sad, that you seemed so sad that they didn't make it. So do you want to give uh, a public I was, response? I was <laughs> I was very sad, but I'm very proud of you all. Um, it, it's a great accomplishment. You've got a great program. Uh, yeah, you represented Florida well. All, all the other programs in Florida, I've talked to some of the program directors and some of their students, and they're just as proud that you were representing us strong in Florida. So yeah, hold your heads high. I'm holding my head high too. <laughs> <laughs> Number four is nothing Number to see that. Four in the nation is awesome. So yeah. great so job. Yeah, great job, Katie, your program director, Dr. Bayhand, Jenny Page Ford, Mark Del Luna. You guys are a great group. Uh, you, yeah, amazing. So great job, students. We're not upset about anything. We are just no. making a show you know, and trying to have a lot of hype and fun with it. But we yeah. are excited and proud of all of you, all of whether, you guys. whether you're in spot 50 or the first place, it doesn't yeah. matter. You know, you um, all are making history. You're doing an amazing job. And we are so excited about you coming in to the profession. And so thank you for participating and being here with us. So yeah, and I feel even better about the profession after seeing all these amazing scores and everything. I, oh, I think yeah. we're just going to be, we're going to be fine. Yeah. Patients are going to be in really great hands with you all. So be very proud of how well you've done. So um, yeah, even looking at um, all of the distribution of the regions of who's in the top 25, it's 
really widespread out there. You know, we didn't have as many people in the West or programs in the West, but yet they're throughout um, the top 25 also. Everybody, um, this is really a lot to be proud of. And so please make sure that your institutions are publicizing where you sat in the nation and how great you did. And just more awareness is always great. So I put the um, I put the standings on the right also of who was in the top six. So um, we didn't leave anybody out. All right. Anything else you want to say, Aaron? No, just very proud. All right. So let's okay. go back down memory lane again to talk yeah, about here. yes, talk about the top two. They have all those, a lot all those to dips that led us to this point. Yes. All right. Do you want to take Weber or do you want to take Southern? Um, I'll take Weber because I know you want to you want to talk about the East. We're both from the East. Yeah. I love West Virginia. It's like a second home. All right. Hit yeah. it, Aaron. <laughs> all right. So Weber, you guys came in strong wrath about you were not messing around. Uh, week one, your time was 33.9. And as we challenged you, and as uh, my co-host was smack talking, trying to get you to go even lower, throughout the weeks, week two, it was 26.75. Week three, 25.63. Um, I think you guys are Terminators, some secret robots that can read hematology slides very quickly. Um, so, so I feel very good about traveling to your area. <laughs> Uh, week four, first place, national time of 25.54 seconds. And then you guys didn't let up one bit. You pushed everyone else to try to reach your scores. And then even down to the very, very end of the semifinals, you were at 23.8. So I, I think you do have rom robotic fingers. And four touchdowns out of six weeks, you were at the top. So you have given everyone a run for their money. And including my West Florida. <laughs> um, so proud. So you are going to be tough competition. And on the other side of the diff. Well, wait a minute. I just wanted to say my team only beat you once. <laughs> once. <laughs> only once. And we were beaten by West Florida. So we were, we were number two in week four. And you all were number three. And West Virginia was number one. And so that's incredible. I'm just, it it's just so wonderful. But yeah, four touchdowns out of a six week, six week competition so far. That's incredible. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> so I know in the video, it's probably going to have our faces over um, Southern's uh, sign here, but for Southern uh, West Virginia Community and Technical College, you all did amazing as well. So you were first in the East the first week out. You were just coming on strong, really, really excited and just moving in there. You were number five in the nation that week. And so that first, um, that first week, I did notice that the West and the Midwest, they had nothing but <laughs> nothing but perfect scores. And even though we did have a good amount of perfect scores, uh, they were not as fat. We were not as fast in the East, but then we picked it up. We did. So um, we started making it down and further and further as we were going along. So in the second week, you were eighth in the East and 16th in the nation with 42.59 seconds. In week three, you were second in the East and fourth in the nation with 29.58 seconds. Just look at that dramatic difference between 42 and 29. Holy cow. Crazy. That was incredible. Way to go. And then number in week number four, you just beat us in Southern Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> and you, <laughs> you were number one in the East and number one in the nation. You snatched it right out from, um, from everybody in the East and you made it into the semifinals, sorry, <laughs> into the playoffs. 
And then you made it into the semifinals because you were third in the nation with 24.56 seconds. So really great job. And in this week, you were number one in the nation. You have coming on strong. That's, yes. That's how the East does it. That's right. You're like, Weaver is not going to take this and neither is Wisconsin. We are going to lay it down and show you we're here. And so out of the whole six weeks, you had two of those touchdowns, only giving up the other ones to Weaver. So it has been a fight these six weeks between the two of you all. (laughs) And we are so happy that you're going to the Super Bowl. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they're fighting for that trophy <laughs> they really are and oh my goodness everybody wants that on their shelves yay for you yeah. so <laughs> we are really excited and so, um you know i would love to come out there in person if weber gets it to utah because we want to go jeeping in utah <laughs> so we've oh, there, got there you go yeah, we've got the state with the arches and all those beautiful rocks that you can go rock crawling in your Jeeps. And then we've got West Virginia that is wild and wonderful. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. My husband's family is from West Virginia. We love West Virginia. All right, here we go. So now we're just going to talk a little bit about lymphocytes. Our Ooh. last group. Yeah, our last, our last WBC to cover. So um, first of all, we're just going to talk about the structure and function. Um, So lymphocytes vary in size and, um, and that's because of the activity that's happening with them. And they do cover a lot of um, a lot of duties in the regard to immunology. So um, your immune system has a, a cell-mediated immunity and humoral immune, immunity and innate immunity. So um, everything pretty much is innate immunity unless it's the production of uh, antibodies, which would be humoral immunity. So we're looking at lymphocytes as being on both sides of the fence there. So T lymphocytes um, are going to be cell mediated um, immunity and um, nonspecific, right? And then you've got B cells, which are going to end up maturing into plasma cells because they get activated and produce antibodies. So Uh, looking at the cells themselves, it is not always easy, if possible, to tell what kind of lymphocyte it is. However, you can notice the difference between a plasma cell versus a um, activated T lymphocyte that is a large lymphocyte. Um, And um, I'm going to scroll down just a little bit to talk about those. So um, with plasma cells, as I said, they are B lymphocytes and they've been activated to produce antibodies. Um, You end up having T lymphocytes that are uh, getting activated as well to um, come and have interaction with B cells in order for the B cells to be activated. So um, as we talked about before with your macrophages, Um, they're part of your innate immunity and they find someone that doesn't look right. (laughs) Um, Airport security. That's right. Airport security. They're in, um, they're going around as monocytes before they get activated by cytokines and chemotaxis to tissues, um, or they've already been to the tissues and they've, um, just been doing their job as macrophages there, like in the spleen, like we were talking about back in week two. Holy cow, it's been that long. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) So um, the um, both B and T cells can be stimulated in the peripheral blood or in uh, organs in order to produce memory cells or effector cells. So memory cells are cells that can come back and say, hey, we've done this before, let's do it again. And in a faster um, kind of a faster kind of uh, succession. And effector cells are gonna be the cells that end up producing something that is very um, efficient. 
So um, plasma cells would be the um, activated uh, B cells that are producing those antibodies, whereas um, the effector cells for T cells are going to be those cytotox um, cytotoxic T cells and helper T cells. So those are a little more specific on the T cell side because um, helper Ts are going and getting information from macrophages that the macrophages, I don't want to talk about the heads again, but um, that macrophages have displayed on their um, outer membrane because they have broken down the entity that is foreign, so like a bacterial cell. They display the antigen on their cellular membrane. The helper T cell comes over and says, okay, I will take that information to the B cells and the B cells get activated to become plasma cells. And then they make the antibodies to whatever the T cells gave them. So with cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells, they have a little bit of a different um, type of modality. So natural killer T cells, um, are with your innate immunity, and they're gonna kill tumor cells and viral infected cells, um, whereas cytotoxic T cells are going to be providing targeted apoptosis to uh, cells by giving the um, contents of their granules to whatever cell they're saying needs to go away. Did you have something to um, add, Aaron? Oh, just the fact that in micro, we're looking, if you see a bunch of lymphocytes, we're thinking viral infection. So that's um, one big thing. But yeah, the and they're T big, they're big oh, lymphocytes yeah. too, right? So yeah. they're, they're those activated T cells. They, they are the ones that you see as being the reactive lymphs. Um, those aren't necessarily going to be your B cells. Those are going to be activated T cells. So that's a really great point. Thanks for bringing yeah. that up. Yeah. Um, so uh, just to make sure we know uh, the difference here, helper T cells are going to be involved with bacterial, um, parasitic, and fungal infections, whereas natural uh, killer T cells, those big ones that we were talking about, are going to go with the viral infections. And when we think about those, I'm going to take us down to this picture. When we think about those, this is what we're talking about. This is a reactive lymphocyte. So see, it's larger and it's got this blue um, basophilic um, border that ends up really touching the red cells that it's in contact with. Now, we're not saying that the red cells aren't, <laughs> we're not saying it. we've got some <laughs> uh, extra chatter on the other end there. <laughs> I think it's the cats. Um, so we have a blue basophilic border here, um, and we're not saying that the uh, red cells are infected with viruses because viruses need, um, in order to survive, they're not counted as living or dead um, because they, they, they kind of have a combination of characteristics of both. Um, but they need the host cells uh, genetic material to replicate and continue to be able to infect cells. So the RBC doesn't have that anymore. Remember week two, they ejected their nucleus before they left the um, peripheral blood unless, unless we had hypoxia and we needed to have some um, rapid turnover in the um, bone marrow and um, pushing out those <clears throat> excuse me, those immature red cells, we might see those nucleated reds, but um, you're not really going to see viruses uh, infecting those red cells. However, you can have intracellular um, parasites like, Aaron, do you want to say any? Um, malaria and different... Um, Babesia? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I... You kind of, so I'm having trouble with my internet today, and he might have already said that, um, but I didn't hear him because it's cutting out for some reason. So I hope it's not a poor recording quality. Um, have I been freezing on your end, Aaron? Okay. You've been good. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so um, when we look at how uh, these uh, cells are actually made, so we're still talking about leukopoiesis because they're white blood cells, but 
Um, specifically, we're talking about where do these actually mature? So um, they are produced in the bone marrow. Lymphocytes are produced in the bone marrow, just like your other um, hematology cells. But what ends up happening is they may end up going to another location in order to mature. So B cells will stay in the bone marrow. So you can think of B as bone marrow, right? And T cells go to the thymus in order to uh, mature. Natural killer cells are the um, plate, you know, the cells that love to go anywhere. <laughs> So they can mature anywhere. They are well, um, they are very versatile. They can be in the bone marrow or the thymus. They don't care just as long as they're having a good time. Yeah. They're just assassins and yeah, they can adapt to anything. Yeah. Oh yeah, they can adapt to anything. I, nice, nice way of putting that. <laughs> there are secret agents, you know, yeah. they're um, down pew, pew, low. Yeah. <laughs> Did you just go pew, pew, pew? <laughs> Technical term. <laughs> um, so um, we are seeing um, the creation of lymphocytes. Again, when, you're, um, when your immune system gets challenged, you're going to end up seeing um, an increase in production, just like we had talked about with your granulocytes. Um, they are not necessarily um, going to be as high as granulocytes. So we'll look up at um, We'll look above the uh, chart in a minute to talk about how much of the peripheral blood smear they are. Um, but they patrol the peripheral blood and they're going to reside in secondary lymphatic tissues awaiting antigen stimulation. So they're just really like walking, sleepwalking <laughs> everywhere they go. They're just like kind of sleeping and waiting to be activated. And then um, they're like, okay, let's do stuff. All right. So looking at your, um, your lymphopoiesis, ooh, um, we've got the lymphoblast here. And just like with the other types of cells that we've talked about, uh, hematology cells, you end up having a blast, <laughs> having a blast. Having uh, a blast. <laughs> With a larger nucleus, um, a lot of times they include nucleoli. You're looking at different um, structures of chromatin, depending on what type of cell line it is. You are thinking of, you know, the pluripotent cell and then whatever cytokines end up uh, triggering the delineation, uh, your blast may look a little bit different. So here uh, we've got uh, basophilic cytoplasm. It's scant. There's not a whole lot because it's all this nucleus, right? And then um, the nucleus to cytoplasm ratio is seven to one, two, possibly four to one. You know, nothing is ever textbook. You always have to really think about, um, you know, these cells don't read your textbooks. They're not always going to look like what you see in your um, in your books and what you've been studying. So get used to knowing the types of terms that we've been talking about and what they look like in practice. What were you going to say here? No, I was going to say exactly. They, they, they don't read the textbook. So they're going to, these in the books are the ideal, beautiful pictures that you hope you're going to see. going to be variations. So that's a very good point. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so um, one of the things that I've been meaning to say is that um, these images that I have been citing have been from the American Society for Hematology Image Bank. So if you are an educator or if you are a student, um, it is really great to go to that website. The images are free to access and you can see the cases that they come from. There's a description uh, on the website with each picture that talks about what the patient was experiencing possibly. They're not, they don't always have a whole lot of information, um, but a lot of them do have case information and you can kind of make a connection between what you're seeing and then what the patient is presenting with. So it helps you to round out your knowledge and get you know, practical experience. So another great resource to study with and to actually for teaching, so. Absolutely. Glad you share. Yeah, so thank you, ASH. We do have a professional organization for every area of the lab. 
And we would be happy to talk about those and another, you know, if you ever have any questions, feel free to um, contact me or Aaron on Twitter. Um, he is, do you want to tell your handle on Twitter? Yeah, so my Twitter handle is at OD0222. So O zero two two two. Um, I'm happy to help with any kind of lab science micro related. Yeah, and he's been doing a lot of um, case studies on Twitter. So if you are rotating through uh, microbiology, he's a really great person to follow. Uh, we have a lot of um, hematology people also uh, on Twitter, whether it's laboratorians or pathologists that um, specialize in certain areas of the lab like hematology. Um, if you ever wanna follow me on Twitter, I try to pull all of those people together and that way repost anything good like the case studies that Aaron does. Um, so uh, looking at the size here, sorry, just wanted to make sure we threw that out there because resources are a very important thing to know. So with your lymphoblast, you've got the size of 10 to 20 micrometers, and uh, you've got a nucleus that has, is kind of central, but could be a little off center. And it might be slightly folded. As I was talking about, you've got your um, one or two nucleoli, and the chromatin is not going to be as clumped yet, but as it gets um, to be a smaller cell, it's going to condense, okay? And so um, even though we have the information here about a prolymphocyte, and this would be a normal prolymphocyte, I wanted to make sure that you understood I could not find a picture of a uh, healthy person's prolymphocyte. And so I ended up having to get a picture of a patient with CLL. So as we've talked about in other episodes, when you have a leukemia, your cytoplasm and your, um, and your nucleus are not going to mature the same way that they would in normal hematopoiesis. So please be aware that this might not necessarily look like a normal um, prolymphocyte because here you've got like three different nucleoli and in um, this description it says zero to one. So I want to make sure you understand that. Um, it also has scant uh, basophilic to clear um, cytoplasm and it's gotten smaller. So you're down to nine to 18. So it's a little bit smaller than your blast. Now we're getting even smaller going down to the mature small lymphocyte Okay, and this is basically your resting guy. Okay, this is your sleeper going around just kind of in, in the peripheral blood, just waiting for something cool to happen. Like all of you, you know, waiting um, for something cool to happen. Selbo comes along and then you're like, yeah, let's get active. <laughs> yes, Aaron? <laughs> Gotta be almost reactive. Oh, yes, you could be very reactive. <laughs> So we've got a uh, very scant cytoplasm here. Um, it doesn't look like a blast though. You've got to look at the chromatin, um, make sure that you see that condensed chromatin is very deep purple and you can see little blotches of deep purple too. Children are going nuts upstairs. I hope you can't hear that. Um, the, uh, uh, sorry, the nucleus is going to be round or oval. It may be off center again, but you're looking at um, the cytoplasm being so small that um, you know you may not be able to tell sometimes. Okay, sometimes they just look like a whole nucleus, and you're like, "What the heck is that?" <laughs> and you have to look really close to see the cytoplasm. So that's the mature. Sorry, go ahead. That's a fair response. Yep. Yeah. So that's a, that's <laughs> mature. So. Um, the difference between this, because you do have the possible lookalike of a RBC, right? We were talking about that, a nucleated RBC could look like um, a mature small lymphocyte. You wanna look at size and the, um, the chromatin, and then you also wanna look at the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is probably gonna be a little more red because of the um, hemoglobin that's being produced towards those end stages um, where you have a nucleated red. 
So be aware of that. And we did talk about that in uh, episode two. So if you want to review that, please go back there. Um, here's a mature large lymphocyte, okay? This lymphocyte has been activated, okay? Boom, we started to do something. Yeah, so we've got um, the possibility of um, producing more of uh, antigen-related information to provide um, information to maybe the B cells or whatnot. So usually when you see the larger um, ones like this, you're gonna think of a natural killer cell or a cytotoxic T cell, okay? Um, when it's activated and it's you know doing things, you see that reactive one. So um, here you can see they're, uh, they've got a difference in size. So a mature large lymphocyte is gonna be 10 to 15 micrometers. It's got a blue to purple uh, oval or round um, off-center nucleus. So you can see that it's over to the side here, but that doesn't mean it's a plasma cell, okay? <laughs> um, that nucleus is bigger um, than in the plasma cell. And you can see that the chromogen, sorry, the chromatin is homogenous. I put both of those words together. Um, and uh, you might see some coarse, clear parachromatin. Um, looking at the cytoplasm, it almost looks transparent sometimes. Okay, it's clear, very light blue. Okay, and there's a moderate amount, as we've said. And you have some primary granules there. And you can, I can't zoom in any further, but you can see these pink. Uh, pink to purple type of granules here, and um, they're producing they're producing um, different things that would be necessary in order to aid in the immunity. So um, there was something I wanted to say, and I kind of just lost it. Um, Aaron, do you have anything you want to say about natural killer cells or anything, and how they relate to our microbes? Um, no. no. Yeah, I think you've covered it. Do you see um, when you do your thick and thin smears, um, do you end up seeing a lot of them? Uh, do you all talk about them in micro if you're in parasitology? Uh, for parasit, typically we're looking for the um, like acinophil counts. That's a big thing. Um, we do see some of the larger lymphs that are there as well, but a lot of it we're looking for the um, acinophil counts. Uh, in our thick and our thins. So, um, and then typically in our, if we're doing like spinal fluids or that kind of thing, we'll, we'll be looking for whether we're seeing uh, reactive lymphs or if to clue us in that it's viral, um, but we're, all, we're using that cell count to kind of, with our parasitemias, yeah, we do some, see quite a few, we'll see lymphs and we'll see, we'll look for the zeaxanthophils. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Um, I did remember what I was going to say um, when we were talking about the differentiation between um, the different types of lymphocytes. Uh, we were talking about them coming from a pluripotent stem cell. Um, what ends up happening is depending on what type of uh, cytokines are present, you're going to end up with information um, that is going to trigger basically what antigen presentation is going to be on the outer membrane. So if you're looking at um, your textbook and it says CD whatever, CD4 cells or CD8 cells, um, clusters of differentiation are really just antigens present on the outer membrane. And those antigens are there in order to help it do its job. So if it is going to be doing um, cell mediated immunity, it's going to have different antigens or receptors basically than what you would see with um, something that is going to be um, reacting to viral um, in <laughs> viral infestation. Uh, <laughs> so uh, going down to the plasma cells, this is where we're really seeing this offset nucleus. Um, you're seeing a really dense chromatin, that deep purple that you see there um, with uh, 
clumps near the uh, nuclear edge out here. So you can see a deepening of purple right there. And then uh, you have this clearing right here. And uh, the nucleus to cytoplasm ratio or N to C ratio is one to one or one to two. And um, I, we could have gone into different, like different plasma cells, like plasma toid cells or uh, plasma cells, but I felt like that was going to be too much for the poster. <laughs> so yeah. I think it covered it pretty well, just having the, the one lineage. So um, these, as we said before, would be um, effector cells of B cells, B lymphocytes. Okay, so these are the guys that are going to be making those antibodies. All right, so you'll you'll see them in infections, and um, if you look at the if you look at your CBC, you're really not going to see a difference in the different kinds of lymphocytes being called by the analyzer. It's really just going to say lymphocytes and then a certain amount versus EOs versus basos versus neutrophils. Sometimes they call them PMNs. Um, uh, but uh, the great thing about this is that you always want to um, you always want to look at what type of lymphocytes you may see because that'll as Aaron was saying that'll give you a clue to what type of infection you may have. When we talk about well, hold on, I think I'm jumping ahead. Um, but when, whenever you look at any type of cell, so if you're looking at your red blood cells and you're trying to evaluate them, you find a small mature lymph because you're looking at the size compared to the nucleus of a small mature lymph. And then vice versa. If you're looking at your lymphocytes, you can go ahead and always compare them to a near white blood cell, like a neutrophil, or you can compare them to a red blood cell. So that is why you always see in these pictures that you've got another cell to compare size to, because I want you all to get used to looking at, okay, I know that an RBC is seven microns. And so let's, let's make sure to analyze cell size because I'm looking at my red blood cell. Oh, well now I need to identify, is this microcytosis or macrocytosis? Let's find a small mature lymph. Let's look at the nucleus and see how that compares. And then you go to your platelets after that, you know, um, and we talked about that. When is a giant platelet really a giant platelet? It's bigger than an RBC. You can have a large platelet that's around the size of a red blood cell, but it's not considered giant. So Aaron, what did you, what were you going to say? No, I was just going to say, um, it's a good point. Um, use the resources you have, use your red cell to things. Um, we'll do that in micro, but if, if the, your red cell is a great resource to kind of help you figure out different cells in some cases with sizing. So always, um, like in the lab, you can't use one result to figure out something and you shouldn't. You compare it and you look at the whole clinical picture. So you also always want to do that when you're looking at the blood um, smear as well. Okay. So let's talk about that automated CBC. We've got the count, we've got the size, we've got the internal complexity, woo! And we've been talking about how the analyzer does that every week. So I don't think that's new to you at this point. No. Um, no. <laughs> with the lymphocytes, um, where do they fall in? They fall in with the white count, they fall in with the automated diff, and um, you will see higher numbers of them than you did with the EOs or the basos, right? But neutrophils are still going to be that higher number. Okay, they should always really be the higher number because they're non-specific immunity and they're just out there patrolling, you know, seeing what's what. And then um, other people get activated and they're like, hey, come on, join the party. Wet blood cells over here. <laughs> like what we're doing today. Um, so um, like I was saying earlier, there's not really any differentiation for the small or large limbs. They just call them lips. So yay. Um, if you uh, have some craziness, you're going to need to look at it anyway as, as a smear review. So what do you see under the smear review? Well, you're going to um, look at the white blood cell count and then, you know, you're surveying your white blood cells. So you might end up doing a manual diff. You're looking at the red blood cells as we were talking about, making sure that they match the uh, indices and the count. 
um, you know, while you're surveying them. And then you're looking at the platelets as well. Um, so you're always doing that kind of thing whenever you look at a smear review. You're kind of doing like a platelet estimate. You're doing a, a review of those red cells. And then if you have to, because you saw a flag, then you're doing your, your manual diff. So you want to look back at your automated diff, see if they're matching what you're finding. Um, you're checking for uh, any indication that the flags from the analyzer were true. As we said, there can be lookalikes. So you want to make sure that that's not what's causing the flag. So you could have a flag because of immature cells. You could have a flag because it's calling a clumped set of platelets, um, a clot. Um, you, they could be calling that a white. Uh, you could be seeing an elevated white because of a nucleated red blood cells. Um, monocytes look very similar to reactive lymphocytes um, and large lymphocytes. And that is always a, <laughs> that's always trouble for students. Um, and, you know, so make sure that you're looking for the vacuoles and uh, with a reactive lymph, you're looking for that um, peripheral basophilia that's wrapping around. So that beautiful blue outlining, it's like, hey, the red blood cell has a blue dress or I'm outlining it like you're coloring, you know, you outline first. Um, you are um, just basically uh, identifying if anything was different than what the analyzer called. All right. So yes. use all, yeah, just use all the data that you have at your disposal. So as you're doing, just like Tiffany was saying, as you're doing your smear review, don't like, completely discard the data you're getting from the automated analyzer, actually see how it fits in, see how it all makes sense. You, you can use little bits of that to help you kind of paint the full clinical picture. So um, that was my little, yeah, big picture. And that gets us to uh, your next part with the conditions. It does. I'm not going to get into specific conditions um, because we'd be here all night and I'm trying to, sure. I'm, I'm trying to keep um, this section um, as, as focused as possible without having a lot of information because I always have to have room for my references. Um, so yes. Could it almost be a point where your regular get another hematologist, uh, use your communication, talk to your pathologist, bring them in to help you with these conditions? Yeah, um, you can see uh, as we were talking about before, when you're looking at the types of lymphs that you're seeing, um, what they look like can indicate what's really going on. You know, if you know that a reactive lymphocyte is a, a T lymphocyte and you know what T lymphocytes do, um, normally those are your natural killer or your cytotoxic T cells that are those reactive cells, um, then it gives you a clue okay, well, this is the type of infection we're looking for, like you were saying. Um, with, with disorders, um, they don't always have to be malignant because everybody wants to jump to a leukemia and you can have a leukemia um, with lymphocytes, right? You have acute uh, lymphocytic leukemia, you have chronic uh, lymphocytic leukemia and if it's acute, you're gonna see more immature cells. If you have a chronic, you're gonna see more mature cells. And like we said, you know, those, um, those cells are not going to look normal as if they had normal maturation because of what's happening in the bone marrow. Um, and, and we did talk a lot about leukemia with Catherine, Catherine. with granulocytes. Um, so you've got that one cell in the bone marrow that's just constantly proliferating. It's taking over the bone marrow. And then, you know, that one line or lineage is going to be the prevalent cell that you'll see in the, uh, in the peripheral blood. And you might end up with a pancytopenia depending on, you know, how far this has gone on. Um, when you have a chronic leukemia, it can turn into acute and then, you know, the patient might not have a good prognosis after that, um, meaning their well-being is, not, is going to be highly effective and they may not be around much longer. Excuse me. Um, so um, 
you know, there's various treatments that you can get. Um, and as Catherine was saying, it really depends on the clinical picture and, you know, case of the, of the patient themselves. Um, it's not really always a one size fits all, right? So, um, so a benign or a um, not really a leukemia, not really a cancer uh, could just be lymphocytosis where you've got uh, increased level of lymphs just from uh, an infection of some kind. So there, there is a whole, there's a whole lot of span of um, um, conditions that you can have. And like I said, that could be a whole poster on its, a whole several posters on its own. Um, and it's really, you know, what do you see um, in the peripheral blood smear? And that may indicate a need for a bone marrow um, review and uh, work with the uh, pathologist. Anything you want to say, Aaron, adding to that? No, I think I'm ready to see some fun, um, fun selfies. Awesome. Um, I, I just want to make sure that I'm showing my references here, um, that they're in the recording. Um, I don't want to take credit for other people's work. Um, one thing that is really good, um, that if you go and you take a look at these references, viewers, if you're a student um, or faculty member, um, you can see the ASH immune, um, sorry, image bank here and you can hit that link. I took the hyperlink out, but you can uh, screenshot it and put it in or whatever, or you can Google it. Um, you can also see uh, that I'm, I've been using um, this, and I want, to, I want to show you. This is the old version, but for students and, come on, students and faculty, this is a really good resource. It's Heme Notes, and if you look at, um, it gives you it gives you pictures and descriptions of cytoplasm and um, nucleus. Here's the difference between a large lymph and a reactive lymph, um, and it gives you comparisons. Um, this is a, a really nice a nice resource. It's wipeable, like you could you could write on it in a sharpie marker and then wipe it off, and you don't lose anything because it's a coated material. Um, but I've been using those um, as a way to help make the charts. Um, I've been using the uh, Rodax hematology um, current edition uh, to help with that as well. So these are really great things that you can use to study for your board of certification exam. Yeah. Um, faculty members, uh, the, hematolo the heme notes that I just showed you are from F.A. Davis. And then Rodax is from... Else, Elsevier. Yeah. So, um, and you get great resources with those as well. And the great things you can find most of these on Amazon and mm -hmm. as you're a student, you can pick up some of these books. And then if you decide you end up in hematology, you can come back and, and keep learning and keep studying. Yeah, I do want to talk about um, in in the finale, I would like to talk about the certification exam, um, the types of things that you would look at in order to prepare, um, because the the website, um, the SCP uh, Board of Certification website has really great information on the uh, materials you can use in order to prepare for the exam. We've only been talking about hematology here, but you know, um, hopefully your first attempt at the BOC is for your generalist certification. And then maybe you might go on to specialists after that. But, um, you know, it has, it has reading lists. Um, it has a breakdown of the guidance uh, or guidelines of the uh, actual exam itself. So I would really like to pull that up. Um, next week to make sure that even though we've done this competition and you've done really well, we wanna make sure you're prepared for moving forward in your career and doing well. Exactly. That's the educator coming out in me. I wanna always yep. make sure mm -hmm. my students know the next step. Yep. Oh. Yes, so um, <laughs> we were have, we, we have been falling off with everybody submitting selfies. <laughs> 
So um, these, most of these are actually the West Virginia team. <laughs> Whoops. Nice. Yeah, Woo, nobody's there. Um, so the West Virginia team was very active. They wanted to make sure that they had um, their first and second years being uh, shown in the presentation and the videos. So here they are. This is not everybody. Um, it's just a few of their. They are ready to. They are competing. They're. They really are. Yeah. They they are going. And if if you go back, I don't want to do this in the episode, but you can always go back. And I was looking. They they have been showing their screens, um, their score screens uh in all of most of the pictures that they've been doing so if you go back to the first episode or the second episode they were showing their screens and i can even just see how much better they've done since that that first picture so uh really great job guys and then of course i had to go back and get weber because they didn't submit one either <laughs> Um, Wisconsin's never submitted one, so you Aww. know, I I don't know. I wish I had them. Um, I'm hoping so, though. Yeah, we've got uh, both of the super sellable teams represented here. So, yay! It's exciting. Uh, congratulations, everybody, and we will see you in the super sellable. Yep. And do your best this week. Absolutely. Forget the rest. <laughs> For it, forget the rest, just do your best. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for watching um, all of these episodes so far. We still have more to do. Um, upcoming in the series is going to be the finale, which will be the uh, Super Cell Bowl. We have some fun, exciting little shorts that we're going to post um, between uh, different individuals. And that's all I'm really gonna say because this should be a yeah. lot of fun. Go. And um, after that, we've got interviews. Um, so we are going to be interviewing the winning team uh, to talk about their rise to fame <laughs> as the first ever Super Soul Bowl winner. And um, that will be a live episode where you as viewers can come and uh, come in online and ask questions about what they did to succeed, what were their strategies, um, ask about their program, how do you get into the program, anything you want. It has to be respectful and it has to be yep. kind. Um, we're not going to, you know, deal with any of the nonsense. So this is, this is for you all to learn. <laughs> are they going to Disney World? Yes, I don't know. Are they going to Red Lobster? How are they going to celebrate? We don't what, know. What team, yeah. If it's West Virginia, they might go whitewater rafting. If it's Utah, they might go to the National um, Arches. <laughs> uh, hey. We don't know. Um, they've got they've got a few national parks out there, I think, in Utah. So that's really cool. And I really want to go there. So if you want to fly me out, I can do it live in person. That would be wonderful. Um, live from Weber. <laughs> yeah, live from Weber. Tiffany in a Jeep. What are they doing? <laughs> Get in, everybody. <laughs> that would be so much fun, though. We could fly my Jeep out and everything. Um, so, yeah, that is what you have to look forward to. We also have a really exciting um, um, friend that has a podcast show. Um, well, actually, a couple of friends because there's three of them together. But um, Stephanie Whitehead is one of them, and she's one of the co-hosts of Elaborate Topics. And uh, she is also a CLP member, which is the ASCP um, Council of Laboratory Professionals. Yes. And so a uh, good friend of both of ours. I've been on yeah. her show before, um, and you all can see that in uh, the playlist of shared videos. Uh, Aaron's been on there as well. And yeah. so, huh? Yeah. Wouldn't be a victory without getting to speak to the laboratory press. Absolutely. So, yes, we are coverage. here for you. <laughs> yeah. Paparazzi and everything. We are here for you. We want to make sure that your uh, information is out there. We're loud and proud about being laboratorians. And we want everybody to understand what it is we really do and how it is that you become a laboratory professional. And so we love unique perspectives and uh, we want to share 
all the information to help you all do well. So we will see you um, in all of those experiences. We look forward to sharing them with you. And thank you so much for subscribing and hitting the uh, notifications button so you don't you don't miss out on any of the fun. And um, let us know in the comments section if you really liked the cell bowl, uh, what you found in, uh, fun about it, if you felt that the tutorials were, um, were good, if they were worth watching. And um, you know, if you feel more prepared for being a student and in your hematology class or the board of certification exam. So thank you again. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.